because as you know we began to look at systematic theologies which are and because we're not just doing a Bible study we're doing something that's much bigger that we could not typically be done on a Sunday morning and we began to talk about Catholicism particularly Roman Catholicism and we were getting in pretty deep and then there and lo and behold the question gets raised the question of the hour the hundred thousand dollar question that was to put me on the spot pastor do you believe Catholics can be saved and so therefore I, I get you know put in that position and here I am out in public on a speaker there's probably people over at the taco place taking notes on me as well who knows and so I get asked this question and I think to myself okay I'm game for it I'll, 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 I'll work through it and um, I'm going to come out Wednesday night blazing. I know that Wayne's going to be in the back and he's going to be checking on whatever I say. And so actually I did prepare a set of notes tonight that are in addition to what I've already given you. In fact, I have so many notes now that this is going to be a nice, long, juicy study. We're going to have a lot of good fun with it. It's going to be pastor's response. And, and the way I go through this, I'm, I'm going to be reading it which I hope is okay, and I'm also going to be commenting along the way because I, I actually want to answer this question that I have entitled, Who is Saved? Kirk. Tonight, before I am skewered, misinterpreted, or misrepresented, I offer the following comments. <laughs> Sounds like a major address, doesn't it? I should have worn a suit and tie tonight, but no. <laughs> now, instead, I actually have a lasagna stain which may be the people at home that watch the video. If you look really carefully, it's right there. But the lasagna was so good, it didn't matter. I just ate it right off my shirt. <laughs> thank you, Linda. And thank you, Kurt, for sharing your piece with me. <laughs> I think salvation is all of God's grace. And believing this as I do, and by the way, that's why I began by reading from Galatians chapter 1 because I stand on the side of the Apostle Paul. I stand on the side of a pure gospel. Believing this as I do, I've witnessed God's grace draw countless people out of false religions, false gospels, and false teaching into the clear knowledge of the truth. That when you see God's grace at work and you know there's only one pure gospel, you get to see, if you share that message, you get the honor and privilege of seeing that at work in people's lives. Oftentimes, and here's now where I begin to delve a little bit, oftentimes that coming out, and by I, that I mean if someone is attached to a religious belief system that is contrary to the gospel, oftentimes coming out of that is immediate. Sometimes people will come to Christ and it's like the light bulb clicks on and they will it just immediately know that they're in the wrong place and it's time to go somewhere else and they hear somebody say you know go find a church where the pastor preaches the Bible and it all makes a lot of sense and so they hop in the car and they go somewhere else. But not always. But not always. I've heard it said, and I agree, a religion owning you from birth to the grave for many generations puts upon people many shackles. Many religions are so intertwined with their culture, where it begins and where it ends is nearly indivisible. I'll, mention this uh, later but I know where we lived in the Republic of Ireland which is the southern part of Ireland because it is predominantly a Catholic nation in the south more like 50 50 in Northern Ireland but that's a different country but people would say to be Irish is to be Catholic that little statement is like saying that's how intertwined culture can be with religion. What's my point? My point is I think God's grace is not only unmerited, not only miraculous, not only powerful, not only instant in spiritual rebirth, 
but it absolutely may begin, for example, how does God reach people? Well, and I believe this, that spiritual rate rebirth may begin in a literal dream a Muslim has at night in a night vision of the true Christ, the true gospel, and the true path through faith alone. There are people, folks, in history who were not reached by missionaries, didn't have radio, didn't have the internet, didn't have television, but their first encounter with Christ was miraculous just like the example of the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. I don't think, still to this day, despite what some might think, I don't think God is limited in how he may choose to reach people. And I believe that there are examples of this. In fact, I know, and this came from such an incredible, reliable source, someone that was in our own mission agency when Linda and I were missionaries years ago, and they shared this story, and I've written about it right here. I know of one verified account where a tribal chief in a dream sees a white-skinned man. Now that was weird for him because everyone where he lived was dark-skinned. He didn't even know white-skinned people existed. But he has this rather bizarre dream, and he hears a voice telling him to welcome that that white-faced skinned person and to believe whatever that man comes and preaches. And what happened? After that tribal chief had that dream, a white-faced missionary shows up and so he welcomes him and says, whatever it is that you have for us, tell us. And that missionary did and that entire village turn to Jesus Christ. Now, that story that I'm telling you, like I said, you know, that's something I really believe happened because the, the person that, that told us that was the director of our mission agency. And I don't really think that he would have been someone that would have made something of that, like that up. What I'm saying is that, that God's grace, God's grace is amazing. And therefore, do I think people may be found where we may not expect them? And this gets to the heart of the question that I was being asked. Do I think people may be found where we might not expect them? And yet we discover in whom God's grace is already at work. The way God works and moves and there is somebody here tonight, and it is, I believe, an example that through Hurricane Sandy, that family watched what our church was doing, and it made an impression. Now, to me, that's an example of God's grace at work. Now, at that time, somebody might have said, well, I, I, how could you possibly say God's at work there? But you see, God was at work in drawing that family to himself. I also think salvation demands faith without works. To me, you know what, that's an absolute point that I'm not going to compromise on. I believe that salvation is by faith alone, without works, and only and entirely in Christ and on the basis of his substitutionary death, burial, and resurrection. I hope this doesn't just come across as just a monstrous theological statement, but something that makes sense to all of you here tonight if you know Jesus as your Savior. What does it mean? It means that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He did everything in all that was necessary to save us. The Bible is ever so clear about that, that Christ died for our sins. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4. Christ died for our sins. And I believe that's, that's where it begins and that's where it ends. And that's why I love those words, and you've heard me say it many times on the cross. He said what? It, it's finished. It's finished. It's done. It's done. 
So that's what I believe. And so therefore, let me say this, I also grieve because, you know, when you get asked a question like that as a pastor and get kind of put, put into a, an awkward position like that, it's important to speak emotionally to this question. I also grieve for anyone who is caught in the snare of false religions and false gospels. These false religions and false gospels grease the path to an eternal hell. It's not funny. It really isn't. And I would even challenge some of you tonight to maybe rethink how you look at that next person who comes to your front door knocking and unless you're right in the middle of something and you really don't have a moment understand please if someone comes knocking at your front door because they want to share their false gospel you need to understand that God just brought the mission field to your front door Amen. Now, this is not about us blowing them off and driving them off our property as you know, our daughter lives, one of our daughters with two, but not married to Kurt, but our other daughter, Addie, married to David, live in Utah. And they're out there doing the Lord's work in the midst of Latter-day Saint country. Since Linda and I went out there and visited that part of the country and had an opportunity to tour the temple, those temple tours are led by young college-age students who are on their own missionary assignment. And you will meet people there who have come from all over the world. I mean that. Who have come, young people from all over the world have come to there, to Salt Lake, to give, what is it, Linda, two years of their lives? Yes, two years. Two two years or so, one or two years of their lives to full-time missionary work. Now, when, you, when you're when you around them and they give the tour, let me tell you, they're really nice. They're, they're nice young people, they, and I believe they are. Well, you just remember, when they come to your front door, you have people come to your front door, for example, who aren't even American. What impression do you want to make on a foreigner who's living in your country on a missionary assignment. What do you want them to go away with? My point is, is that to me, I'm sad for people who don't know Jesus. I really am, especially for the young ones, the young adults that don't know the Lord. There's a wonderful family now who has converted to Jesus. Uh, they have a ministry and their own son, his mother was a teacher in Provo at, at Brigham Young University. And their one son went on his missionary trip. Do you, I don't know if you know this, but Mormons, from the time a child is born, every month they put money aside in an account for their children's missionary year or two when they grow up. Every, every month they do that as, as a family. So this boy grew up, he went off. His assignment was, was in Florida. And he went to a house where there was a Baptist preacher. So his goal was to lead that Baptist preacher into Mormonism. And as it turned out, it worked in the opposite direction. And he came to know the Lord Jesus. And the young man went back witness to his own family. His mother came to Christ and lost her job. She was a professor at the university. And their family since that time have been now witnesses and missionaries for Jesus Christ. Because that Baptist preacher didn't yell out the front door, get the you know what off my lawn. Now, there's a joke in my family because I really like Clint Eastwood in this one movie where he tells, get off my lawn. You know, I think it's kind of a funny thing. But seriously, if that's been you, and it may be. But how about changing that tonight and realizing that 
hey, you know what? That's a young person at my door. And here's an opportunity to, when they want to pass their materials to me, I'm going to pass mine to them. We all have to learn together, don't we? Right? You know what I'm saying? So, anyway, that rebuke goes to me just as much as to all of us. And I just wanted to make that point. Yet the narrow path to a relationship with God is through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That doesn't change. And in evangelism, and I want to talk about evangelism, in evangelism, our goal is to present a pure gospel. Our goal is to present a pure faith. But we have to realize something. When real evangelism takes place, it's, it goes so far beyond, and I'll just put it this way, it goes so far beyond praying the prayer. You, you may not realize some of us, others will, but praying the prayer can be a trap for some people in religion because they're taught to pray a lot of prayers. And so if they hear you say, well, if you'll only pray with me, in their mind, they'll say, sure, why not? Because I pray lots of kinds of prayers. But when we present the gospel to people, we realize the harder work in witnessing may actually be peeling back the layers of religion which actually keep people from being born again. And that's hard, especially when in some religions, and many, that it is so intertwined with culture, and it begins at birth, and it goes all the way through your whole life, right up to the grave, you've got a lot of work ahead of you. In other situations, I've witnessed people coming to Saving Faith People come to saving faith, but then the real struggle begins as the shackles of their former false religion must be torn off piece by piece. I look at the congregation as, as a, we're all on a journey, hopefully on the same journey, but we all are in a very different place in our journeys. We're all, we're all being taught of the Lord and some are more spiritually mature than others some more knowledgeable than others, some maybe closer to the Lord than others, but that's part of why we come together because we kind of rub off on each other and hopefully that helps us on that journey. Why am I, why am I saying this? I'm saying because there's not a perfect person here tonight. Some people, when they come to Jesus Christ, it's really hard. You know how hard it is for somebody who has believed and their family has believed for generations that it is absolutely necessary to baptize a baby, otherwise that baby will not go to heaven. Do you know how grueling and difficult that is for, for a person coming to the Lord to, to have to struggle with an issue like that? That's a hard thing for some people. And I think that we, we need just to realize that sometimes these things need, can only come off piece by piece. For example, here's a great example. Uh, we support a lady in Jews for Jesus. I have compassion for a Jewish person who is truly born again through faith in Christ. Next page. But then when that Jewish person comes to Jesus, they hear people from within Judaism say to them, you know what you've done? You've apostatized from Judaism. And you, you should even call yourself Jewish. Why? What's not an example of? Again, it's an example of how closely attached culture can be to belief. In other words, to be Jewish, right, is not to believe in Jesus. And definitely not to call yourself a Christian. Horrors of horrors. Or as I mentioned earlier, I've known Irish people who when they left Roman Catholicism were told, you're no longer Irish and you've disgraced your family. I also think God knows those who are his from eternity. As I've always said, God knows everything there is to know. It's impossible for God not to know. And so God does know from all eternity those who are his. And if they are his, they will ultimately come to know his son through faith before passing from this life. Did you just catch what I said? 
if God knows Romans chapter 8 for whom he foreknows he has predestined to become conformed into the image of his son whom he has called who he's justified and who he would ultimately glorify we may be surprised at our own salvation because we know where we've maybe come from but God isn't because he's forever known it's just impossible for him not to know and so knowing this let's remember something it may be in the last moment of a person's life like the thief on the cross that a person comes to know Jesus as their Savior that's why you know like at funerals and stuff I'm not God I'm sorry I don't know what happened in the last moments of that person's life a person could have been laying in their bed and maybe remember what their grandmom read to them when they were little and break down before the Lord before their last breath and find the person that they meet next is the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven we don't know <laughs> just because I'm a pastor or we have elders in our church I've never felt like we are in some sort of hierarchical position to make that ultimate determination about where people stand before God. <laughs> we try our best, but it really comes down to the Lord. I don't rule out, I don't rule it out that the truth may come to a person in a vision, in a dream, whereas the scriptures say, by the feet bringing glad tidings of good news. Honestly, if God knows someone from all eternity, he's not going to lose them. However, here's, because someone might say, well, if that's true, then why should we witness? Because God's grace isn't our excuse, isn't our excuse to avoid gospel proclamation. The salvation, salvation gift paid by Christ's blood is our commission to proclaim. Hey, look, there is no greater joy and I don't know if it's age or what happens, but I get, if that's one thing I'm joyful about, is I, I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded. And I find myself even more persuaded the older I get. When I begin to realize that my salvation isn't based on me, it's based on Him. And because I know He keeps His promises, Boy, that gives me great comfort and peace and hope. And that's why it's even become easier to share. So here we go. Dun, 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 dun. When I get asked, do I think all blank go to hell? Why not ask me, do I think all blank go to heaven? Now think about that for just a moment. There's two different ways of framing that question. Oh, and by the way, I, I left it blank on purpose. Because there's a lot of groups, denominations, religions there's there's you could pick one so therefore that's why just because i began to look at catholic theology i wasn't just going to get pinned down just on that one because i positively confess and believe there is salvation in no other name than the name of jesus christ my conviction has not changed I still absolutely believe in the narrow way. I still absolutely believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through Him. And it utterly amazed me to be at a Thanksgiving service my first year here and have a guy walk up to me and say, boy, that was refreshing. And I said, well, what was refreshing? He said, well, it's been a number of years we've heard about Jesus at Thanksgiving. And I thought, oh, how absolutely appalling. <laughs> Because that's all I, that's the person I want to talk about, right? Because he's so wonderful. 
and I want everyone to know him. So frankly, I don't like blanket questions leaving no room for something I trust belongs to God, not me. As I've already said earlier, sometimes God is saving people out of places and religions we would never expect him to do that. Like a tribal chief whose tribe is cut off from the rest of the world. I know there's a hell and I know there's a heaven and I also know there's only one mediator and redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. But to that question that would want me to, and by the way, you know what the key word is in this question? It's the word all. All. All is a, kind of a black and white. There it is. All. I refuse to stand in the place of God with that question. Now, I sure hope you've heard tonight my, my theology about the gospel hasn't changed. <laughs> I, I still stand firmly on Jesus Christ being the only way. And when I mean the only way, I, I really mean the only way. This isn't the Oprah show. <laughs> thank God. So I thank you for listening and coming. But one, now here's the thing. And this is an observation. One consolation I have is observing how people, being people, may not be rubber stamped by their religion despite what their religion may teach. I'd be naive if I thought everyone who hears my preaching and teaching upholds my frail words as the final word. Boy, I would have quite the pride issue if I seriously believed that everyone who came on a weekend or on a Wednesday night necessarily signed on to everything I always said. Because I don't. <laughs> I've changed views sometimes. That is to say, if God is drawing out his kingdom from the nations of the world, and I believe he is, I rest assured he will complete the task with absolute precision. What does Jesus say about himself and the Father? Whoever is in the palm of my hand, no one gets to seize them out of my hand. Whoever is in the hand of my Father, no one gets to seize them out of my Father's hand. That's assurance, isn't it? And what that tells me is that whoever God's sheep are, are assured of eternity. Now, I wrote this very carefully, the last sentence. Not one he knows, that is God, from eternity will be lost, just as those who will be condemned are not hidden from his omniscience. God just simply knows, and I just leave it at that. Now, here's the thing. Everything I've said here tonight, I will brand false religion. I will brand a religion false where I see it. That's kind of my job. It is my job. And it's probably why sometimes people disagree with me. Because they may not necessarily like what I said. Too bad. That's what I'm really kind of paid to do. And I and knowing most of you here in this church, that's I've had so many of you say to me, that's absolutely what you like about that. And I you know you're smiling at me, Michael. And it's remember Michael saying to me one time, Pastor, that's why we come here because <laughs> you know, and she kind of also hinted to the fact, and if you didn't do that, we wouldn't be here. So I will brand an impure gospel where I see it. Where, just like Paul in Galatians chapter 1, if I believe the gospel message is being distorted, if I think anything is being added to it, I'm going to step up to the plate and I'm going to say, that's wrong. That's wrong. You hear me so often refer to Jesus as the Lord Jesus. There was a former member, he's going on in ministry now, pastoring a church. He said to me one time, he said, I noticed you, you say, Lord Jesus. And I said, yeah, I do. Because Jesus is everything the Bible presents him to be. He is Lord. And that's why one of the things I feel is, I think it's utter nonsense in sharing the gospel when you leave out the word Lord because you think somehow that's good. No. 
He's Lord. He's King. He's Messiah. He's God. He's a prophet, a priest. He's so much more. Amen? Amen? The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Those are all, that's, that's Jesus. And I will go after the dear people with the gospel of God's grace by faith alone in Christ alone with all my heart. And hopefully my record in witnessing isn't calling someone brother or sister if she or he tells me. Now, I want you to see this. I'm not going to call somebody my brother in the faith or my sister in the faith if that person says to me that they truly believe that by faith plus works, I'm saved. No, to the contrary, I will tell such people, hopefully with a little bit of seasoning of grace to my words, because this, this is really, this has been the truth of my life for a good 40 plus years, 50 years, whatever. Actually, I started witnessing the week I was saved at age seven. It's true testimony. I came to Christ at age seven at Camp Word of Life. Mom and Dad came in the middle of the week to, to visit because that's what the parents did. And when my parents came to visit, my mom recalls that when I got in the car, my first questions and, and actually barrage of questions was drilling my parents about whether or not they were born again. I don't remember that, but that's what she said happened. I believe I probably did do that though. It is to say, when, if someone were to say to me that they believe they were saved by faith plus their works, and you know, that can be said in a lot of different ways. Someone could say, for example, I've kept all the commandments, or I've lived a good life, or whatever, right? Just fill in the blank, right? I will say to that person, I will, that's not true. That's not true. That's not salvation. It might be what you think, but that's not true. Can I tell you what is true? Shall we fill in the blank? You see, be that person a Baptist, a Catholic, a Mormon, I'll still proclaim Jesus. I have spoken to people, and let's pick on people within sort of our own sheepfold. Where I've asked people, do you know the Lord? And the answer I've gotten is, I'm a Baptist. And they might, they could have said, I'm a charismatic. They could have said, I'm a Presbyterian. I've had people say that, I'm a Presbyterian. And my immediate thought in my mind is, I don't care what you are. Because that's not the question I was asking. Because when, could you imagine heaven now, no, I'm sorry, you know, but I, I grew up in a Baptist church, so I'm allowed to pick on them. But could you imagine if you went to heaven and everybody was Baptist, and they were only Baptist, right? But do you know that for a season of my early life, that was sort of the mentality of people? Listen to me. I, like I said, I'm not going to put my arm around someone and and assume that they're born again, especially if they tell me that they're trusting in their works for salvation, because I know that's not true. God's amazing, and Jesus is the only way. And I would imagine tonight that God is drawing unto himself people from tribes, tongues, and nations, and even religions not through those religions, but to Jesus Christ. And that before they breathe their final breath, they will confess him as their savior and Lord. Well, I hope that's given you something to think about tonight. Food for thought, a little bit of a different evening, but to address a very, very important question. Father God, oh, that we would be witnesses for you, that we would get past the labels, labels sometimes that, quite frankly, just make the issues more confusing, and instead see people, and instead, from our standpoint, be 
even more committed to sharing a clear gospel message with a clear invitation. And I pray, Lord, and do believe that your work of grace will be accomplished for your glory. Now bless each and every person as we go to our own homes. In Jesus' name, amen.